Okay. Um, the next presentation is from Luigi Calzolai. Um, who will talk about measuring protein structure, stability of protein nanoparticle systems. So, thank you. Let me thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work here today. Um, so, oops. I'm working at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission in Italy, and the work that we present here, we just published in October 2008, last year, in, on nanoletters, and here is the full reference if you want more details. Um, so, oops. Okay. Well, a lot of part missing. Um, but let me just explain this. Uh, in the nanobiotechnology group, uh, GRC, we, try, we are interested in understanding the relationship between how nanoparticles behave in biological systems. And we start, there is something missing here, about syn we synthesize in some cases our own particles so we can control the quality and the size and the functionalization of what we study. And then it, we test them in vitro for toxicity testing, like cytotoxicity, genotoxicity. And in parallel, something missing here, is the full characterization in terms of size, particle size distribution, surface characterization, and we develop method for improving this step. And then we start how the properties of these nanoparticles influence the, pro, uh, the structure of the protein, how they interact with these nanoparticles, and we try to connect how the changes in the structure and stability of the proteins will influence the toxicity or potential toxicity of the particles. So how we do this? Well, there are several ways. Um, we start from simple things like flow field flow fractionation and light scattering to measure the particle size distribution in solution. And then you can use fluorescence, UV visible, sort of simple spectroscopic technique to detect the interaction of protein with nanoparticles. Going up in complexity, circular diapers will give you the secondary structure is able to track secondary structure changes and stability of the proteins when it interacts with the, particle, with the nanoparticles. You can go all the way up to the high resolution three-dimensional structure of the protein using nuclear magnetic resonance. We did this two years ago. We published this in nanoletters. Um, today, I will talk only about circular dichroism. Uh, circular dichroism is uh, basically a spectroscopic technique where you have the region 180 nanometers to, to, to 440 nanometers. This, the spectra is sensitive to the structure of your pro to the secondary structure of your protein. So if you have an alpha helical protein, we have this characteristic shape with a double minimum and maximum. Here, if you have a beta sheet protein, you have a completely different spectra. What's the advantage of the technique is that what you record is the sum of all the secondary structure elements present. And the other big advantage, it can work, you can work with very low concentration of your sample. So what we did here was something a little bit special. We didn't use a standard circular diagram instrument, but we used as a light source, a synchrotron radiation light source using the, uh, the diamond light source in Oxfordshire, UK where one of the beam lines is used as a source for, to excite the spectra and this record the CD spectra. So because we are using synchrotron radiation, you have a very high brilliance, and the source is very highly collimated. So it was possible to use a very long cell, 10 centimeter cell that you see here, with just 0.8 milliliter of sample, so less than one milliliter sample. So here, uh, 
They are the example of the spectra of three different proteins, human serum albumin, human transthyretin, human lysozyme, measure with a little bit more than one microgram of sample corresponding to 20 nanomolar concentration for human serum albumin. As you can see here, this is a typical alpha helical protein and the spectra is quite good and you can probably even go lower in concentration if you acquire more scans. So in this way, you can detect changes in the secondary structure of your proteins when you add nanoparticle. In black here is the free protein. In red is the free protein with silver nanoparticle. In a ratio, this is a ratio of number of molecules to number of nanoparticles around 40 to 1. As you can see here, human cell albumin doesn't change structure much, interacting with the silver nanoparticle. If you repeat the same, with lysozyme, you see a huge change. What happens? What we think is that, so these are the surface electrostatic potential of the two protein, a pH 7, where we are running the experiment. The human cell albumin is mainly negatively charged, interacts a bit, but not much. Lysozyme is positive at this pH, interacts strongly with the negatively charged silver nanoparticles, precipitates, and you see much less protein solution. So basically, you, here you are tracking precipitation of the lysozyme, at least that's our idea in this case. If you use uh, circular diagrams, you can do more than track it changes in secondary structure. You can track stability. You can follow the thermal unfolding process of proteins how you do this experiment, you record the series of CD spectra at increasing temperature. For example, from 20 to 90 degrees, we were going up every two degrees. Like here is for the free human cell albumin, quite low concentration. And then you can analyze the data using singular value deconvolution of the, your data set. And here is the results. It basically tells you there are only two species that describe all the data set. One is the folded structure of the protein in black. In red is the unfolded, thermal unfolded structure of the protein. Tell, tells you, first thing is that you don't have an intermediate, as sometimes happen with some proteins. Then you plot the percentage of folded structure against temperature, and you fit with a Boltzmann equation. Boltzmann type. From the fitting, you get two information. One is the flex of this transition is the melting temperature of your protein. The slope of the transition is related to the cooperativity of the unfolded process. So we did this with free protein, human cell albumin. We get a melting temperature around 75 degrees repeated with gold nanoparticles in a ratio of protein to nanoparticles, 20 to 1. It's not 1 to 1, but it's quite close. And you see that the process is basically very, very similar. The melting temperature is around 75 degrees. It's the same in the experimental error. When we repeated this with silver nanoparticles, it's quite different situation. You get a melting temperature of 69 degrees, and you even see here that the slope of the process is quite different. So in this way, with this experiment, we were able to measure a decrease of 6 degrees in the thermal unfolding, the thermal stability of the human serum protein interacting with silver nanoparticles, while, for example, this not happens with gold nanoparticles. So that, let me acknowledge the people that helped in this work. This was a close collaboration with the people, Giuliano Siligardi Rohan at the Diamond Life Source in UK, my colleagues at Jersey in ISPRA, and finally, thank you for your attention.
Questions? Yes. Silver ions are known to bind to lysozyme proteins and induce structural changes. And uh, I wonder how you differ differentiate between the effect of um, dissolved silver plus cations and the silver nanoparticles. Um, yeah. Well, I have to say that um, in this case, we didn't, we didn't measure uh, how much uh, silver ions was dissolved. So this is, but this is something that we can easily control because we can measure the, the amount of dissolved ions, especially silver with ICPMS, with ion coupled plasma, that's kind of, of simple. And then the other way, there would be, it's obviously to repeat the same measurement with silver and nitrate. So with a measure with some silver one I sold. But here, what you see is that also we know that the protein interacts with the silver nanoparticles because we follow this with the SPR band in the, in the visible region. Okay, this is something that I didn't have the time to show here, but we always to control this, that the complex happens, and silver and gold in, from this, as the previous speakers show, you have this very intense visible band, and it's very, very sensitive to something happening at the surface. If you, there is an interaction, you see a shift in the band, in either position or intensity. Yes. Um, uh, albumin is known as a sink for whatever is circulating in the blood. Um, my question is, uh, if you mix albumin and lysosan, do you see a preferential uptake uh, or binding to albumin as compared to lysosan? And the second uh, uh, doubt was uh, about uh, the changes uh, in the structure of the two, uh, actually the albumin protein that you see a shift in temperature uh, of six degrees at temperature that are never reached in the human body. Is it uh, relevant? Okay, so first, first question. Um, with this technique, you are not going to see differences. If you mix two proteins, it will become very difficult. So you had to do a different way. And we are doing, we are developing a completely different method based on flow field flow fractionation. These techniques like NMI works when you work with one protein, usually. So it has to be a clear system. The second question was about the temperature. temperature. Well, you are not checking in the human body. What you are checking here is the thermal stability of the protein, of your system. So one protein is more, this is a thermal unfolding. If a protein has a lower melting temperature, it also starts to unfold earlier. Okay, so it's not relevant in the sense you don't reach the thermal unfolding in the human body, but you have a protein that uh, unfolds easier. Unfortunately, um, the technique is very powerful. You can even um, the, to extract thermal parameter, delta G of, the, of unfolding, but you can do this only when the refolding process is reversible. In this case, it's not reversible. For big proteins, usually it's not. Okay, then we thank the speaker again, and we proceeded. <laughs>